So what I want y'all to do, if you're going to play along with me, is to go ahead and if you have Python installed on your computer, and you would know if you've installed it on your home machine, I mean on your laptop. If not, use the computer in front of you. What I want to do is I'm going to go down to the little magnifying glass and type in IDLE, idle, and launch that. That takes us into something called the Python shell. Well, what's a shell? A shell is a place where you can enter programming commands and get immediate results like this. I could say A equals 2, hit enter, and then B equals A times 3, hit enter, and then say print, parentheses B, hit enter, and it tells me what B is equal, right? So these are variables, these things with the letters. We put 2 into A, we put 3 times A, which is you know, just like algebra, and to B, and then we printed it out. So you could write little programs inside the shell, but you really wouldn't to. You really wouldn't want to. Why? Because you can't edit it. I can't go back and move my cursor up here and say, oh, A really should have been equal to 21. Oh, man. No, nah, no, nah, you can't do that. So this is like telling somebody what to do. Yo, put 2 into A. Yo, put 3, you know, into B, whatever. You know, the shell lets you do that, but writing a program is like writing out stage directions and giving them to somebody to do, right? Which is a much more uh, powerful concept, right? Because you could write, you know, something that was, you know, you could write a play that was 10,000 pages long and you give it to somebody and they'd go and do it all. So a program is like a recipe. It's a series of steps that you follow or that the computer follows according to what you want it to do. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to click File, New File. And now I'm writing a program. So, if you ever come in, you're two minutes late into the class and we're already, you know, typing along and stuff like that, always do file, new file. Don't just start typing commands into the shell because they may work for a little while, but then after a while they're not going to work, right? Because this isn't really a place for writing your programs. This is where you write your programs. File, new file. And there are other Python editor, ed editors. editors. There's one called JetBrains. I think we still have that installed on here. PyCharm. Yeah, yeah. And we could play with using this, but idle comes installed every time you install Python. Python is free to install on your home computer. You know, it only takes a couple of minutes and you already get the idle editor so you don't have to go and add any add-ons. But this is a cool editor. We ought to play with it a little bit someday. But not today. So I've done file, new file, and I need to create a directory somewhere to save my work. And why do I say that? Because if I click save right here, it dumps me into the bowels of the Python system files, right? You don't want to save anything in here. And look at that. It looks like somebody has. Yeah, I, I see three programs that people have saved out here. I didn't do it. It's not my fault. Um, if you save stuff into the Python 37 directory, you can eventually break Python to where it won't even launch. And for a while, until I started, you know, belaboring that point and saying that, you know, at the start of every class period for a while, that would happen. Um, and then you'd have to uninstall and reinstall Python, or it would take us you know, quite a little bit of time in order to figure it out. Because the, these directories are not write protected, even on the school computers. Right? I could go in and I could delete these files, and I could create new ones and stuff like that. I could really mess things up. So you don't want to save your work into the Python 37 directory. Please don't. If it makes you feel good to be saving it something right there, you could make a subdirectory right off that, but I wouldn't. I would put it like off the desktop or something like that. So anyways, I'm just gonna click on desktop and click on new folder and make a new folder for myself. Now you might be bringing a flash drive, you know, something like that in the future. But for now, I'm just gonna make one off the desktop. It's not a bad idea to use a flash drive because the IT department could swap these computers in and out at any time, or they could reformat them. There's absolutely no guarantee that the data that you save there today will be there the next time you come into class. Usually it will be, right? But then that usually might, you know, come back to catch you. So you might want to bring a flash drive just to back up your files, if nothing else. I love flash drives, and then every time I get one, I lose it within two days. So hope you have better luck with them than I do. So I'm going to go into CIT 12003. And what am I going to call this? I'm just going to call this Lecture A. 
And we're not going to do a lot of programming because we have to do the fun stuff like the syllabus. But we're going to write just a little bit of a program here. So I'm calling it Lecture A. And notice that it says save as types Python files. I could change it to save as a text file, in which case it add .txt to it. Usually I don't want that. I'm going to leave it as Python files. All right. Is my font large enough for everybody to see? No, nope, not at all. If you go into Options, Configure Idle, you can change a bunch of stuff. What do I want to change? I want to make the font larger, easier for y'all to read. That may be too large. We'll find out. All right. So when you're writing a program, there's kind of two broad categories of things you could do. One is which you could put programming commands into it, and another is you could put comments into it. And basic programmers call them remarks, and they type in REM space, and then they put you know some text like this is my first program or something like that. Well, we're going to add some comments here. I'm just going to put shift three, the pound sign, the hash, and I'm going to put my name. Don't put my name. You know your own name, right? And I'm going to put what class this is and what day this is. Good question. Is it the 22nd? Yeah, 21st. All right. And maybe I'll put a description. For a program. When you're writing your programs at home to turn into this class, I do want you to do something like this. It's called a comment block. Comments meaning that it doesn't change the way the program runs. It's just a comment about it. But it lets you understand what your program does. If you come back to it three years later and you open up that PY file, you're not going to have an idea of what it does. But if you have some comments up at the top, you will. So. Just like you would put your name on any English essay that you upload, you know, to get graded, put your name on your work. So what are we going to make this one do? Let's make it print some kind of message over and over and over. We're going to use a while loop. What's a while loop? Well, we'll, we'll find out, but we're just going to play for now. X equals 10. Now, X is a variable, and we're giving it the numeric value of 10. So on the next line, if we did print x, it would print out 10. We could prove that. Print parentheses x in parentheses. You see the way that this changed into a different color? This is called a function. One of these algebraic statements you know, does kind of like a single line of code. But a, func a function goes and runs a whole bunch of statements in order to accomplish its uh, its task. And you can write your own function. What do I mean a whole bunch of statements? Well, the code required to display something on a screen is really pretty complicated, right? Because you'd have to write it once for your Linux machine and once for your Mac and once for your Windows, you know, and it has to... Anyway, so this is actually a complicated process. Printing anything on the screen is. But the developers of Python gave us a library command, the function command, to do it for us. So we don't have to sweat how to use it. We can just call it with a single word and it magically does everything that we need it to. Let's see if it works. I could click File Save, but when you click Run, Run Module, this Run Customize popped up there recently. I need to figure out what that does. When you do Run Module, it executes the program. And it printed out 10 because that's what x equaled. If we change it to say x is equal to 20, then of course it's going to print out 20. So if you've done C++ programming or Java programming or whatever, this is a much faster, much you know, more interactive way to develop programs. Because in C++, you could not write two lines of code and then have it run. You know. You'd have to have like 20 lines of boilerplate code around it to get it to work. And Java's kind of the same way. And C++ does not give you a window, you know, that shell in which you can enter programming commands directly. All right, so let's use that 
number 10. Let's make it count down like a rocket about. So the shell window, I can always close because it'll relaunch any time I run the program again. I don't like it in my way. I'm going to close it. And I'm going to delete that statement. I don't want it printing out 10 anymore. Instead, I want a loop, which is going to print out 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, lift off. So while x is greater than 0, colon. Now, your brain has to kind of translate what I'm saying as opposed to what you see up here. I said while x is greater than 0, colon. I didn't type is greater than, right? We have to kind of just kind of agree on common terminologies that when I say is greater than, and I might leave off the word is, right? X greater than zero, that's what it needs to be. Because unfortunately it has to be exact, precise syntax or it won't run. I'll deliberately do that um, pretty soon, you know, I'll be making my own syntax errors and you'll be making them, I won't have to do it deliberately. All right, so while x is less than 10, let's print x, print parentheses, x comma, quote, double quote or single quote, doesn't matter in this language, dot, 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 end quote, end parentheses. And on the next line, x equals x minus 1. And do you have to space it out like that? Nah, I could take out all these spaces. Now I'm going to back tab against the far margin. Like that. And the last statement of our little program is going to say print, parentheses, quote, Lift off exclamation mark. End quote in parentheses. Now I'm going to run it again. Since I haven't saved it, you can tell it's not saved because there's an asterisk up in the file name here, right? That goes away as soon as you save it. Fast way to save is just to hit Control S. I do that by habit. You, you won't even see me do it. I won't say that I'm doing it quite often. But if you don't save your program, as soon as you click Run Module, it asks you if you want to. And it did it. It printed out 10987654321 liftoff. All right, we are now programmers. Let's go make a million bucks. So Python, is it a dumb language? Is it a trivial language? Is it a toy language? There used to be languages that were invented almost purely for teaching, right? Pascal was a language that was invented almost purely for teaching. But then people took that language and, you know, a lot of the original Macintosh programs were actually written in Pascal. You know, they got turned into something that, you know, was commercially viable. Python is not a teaching language at all. It's used by lots and lots and lots of companies. It, it's a, a good thing to have on your resume. You know, the reams of data that uh, NASA gets from their, you know, their, their space probes and stuff like that. Um, the people who are processing those data write Python programs in order to manipulate the data. You know, system administrators use it to control, you know, um, things running on the, the machines. It's a very useful language. It's a very powerful language. But it's also got a pretty easy syntax. And so that kind of, it's kind of like a double blessing, right? Not only is it a powerful language that a lot of people use to make money, it's easy to learn because the syntax is not that bizarre. But there are a few quirks in it. One is that, and don't do this because this would break your program. In some languages, you use curly braces to denote blocks of code, like that. This language doesn't use curly braces. If I tried to run it now, run. yeah, invalid syntax. And notice it doesn't give me a lot of clues. It doesn't tell me what's invalid about it. I just kind of have to know, oh, I should have put a colon there. That's how this language marks off blocks of code, is 
with a colon there and then using indention. Everything that's indented is part of a block of code. What would have happened if I had not backed tabbed this? Well, now, yep, it's going to print liftoff every time. Very good, because it is now part of this block of code that's in the while loop. And I run it. There. Kind of does what we want it to, but not really. That that's that's it's really messy and cluttered, so I'm not going to do that. Very silly, isn't it? Yep. So, unfortunately, that means that this language is a lot pickier than other languages about its indentions. What do I mean by that? Don't type this because I'm deliberately making mistakes. It may not be obvious, especially if there were like 20 lines of code and then some spaces there and stuff like that, but these are not of the same indention level. Code looks pretty good, but it's not going to run. Yeah. At least it kind of tells us unexpected indent. That, that's a better error message than the one about, you know, the missing colon. So in order to fix that, I would just have to come up here and remove that. So this is an editor that also runs programs and dis displays results. It had, kind of has all three capabilities in it. You saw that I ran the program, I wrote the program, and it displayed the output. That makes this an integrated development environment, IDE. And well, what was the name of the program we ran? IDLE, IDLE. IDE is part of its name. Now the reason the guy named it Idle is he, the uh, inventor of the language is a Monty Python fan. And if you know Monty Python, one of the main actors in the troupe is Eric Idle, I-E-L-E. So I'm surprised that there weren't you know, other programs named after other members of the troupe. So we will be using this an awful lot, but it's not the only way you can do Python programming. You could use that PyCharm JetBrains thing that I showed you. Or you can even go online. If you Google up online Python 3 and just pick one of the many links that comes up. Say you're on your phone and you just really have an urge to write some Python. You can go out to a website like this. And that's really pretty cool. The only reason that I don't recommend doing it like this is because you don't really save your program, right? As soon as I close my window, it's pretty much gone. Now, some of these sites do let you create logins and you can do saves and stuff like that, you know, but otherwise. But if you had to do some homework and you didn't have Python installed or you were away from your home machine, you know, and you still wanted to get something done, you could use one of these online Python editors. And I kind of like the way that it plays, displays the code in one window, you know, in the... Uh, and the output right in the next. There's all sorts of these too, you, you can see. Yes, sir? What about NetBeans? Well, NetBeans, I don't know if there's a Python module for NetBeans in the, or not. Let's look it up. There is for Visual Studio, for UC++ programmers. You can install Python on uh, Yeah, that, that is absolutely true, absolutely true. Hey, yeah, you ought to try that. I ought to try that. That'd be interesting. Yeah, there's lots of different programming editors. Um, a commonly used one is NetBeans. Another commonly used one is Eclipse. And the third commonly used one is Visual Studio, which is by Microsoft. So it gets used a lot by the people who want to write Windows software. That's interesting. We'll have to look that up. You ought to install that, see what you think. Pardon me? Oh, yeah, yeah. Donna uses a lot. Solo Learn is pretty cool, and I don't remember to make good use of it. The one that I used to use a lot, you have to pay for now, Code Academy. Which disappointed me. I used to used to use this a lot. Ah oh, well. Anyways. That's enough of that. So we have written a program. Let's let's do the uh, even more exciting syllabus kind of stuff now. Mm -hmm. 
Alrighty, so we know the name of the class. Even I learned it once you informed me. We know where we're meeting. This is the textbook. You need to get the MindTap version of it because we do have assignments on it that require MindTap. That means that if you bought a physical version of the textbook, the kind that you can hold in your hand, you're unfortunately still going to need to go and get MindTap. Um, and then once you get MindTap, then you get an online version of it that you can read. Yes, sir? I think that's the wrong book because that's... Uh, we have the Python book and what happened? Am I on the wrong section one? again? Let's go well, home and come back like tomorrow. Python. Yeah. Luckily, I have Cengage Unlimited. Yeah. That is wrong. What is our correct book? How do we find that? I cannot believe that I put the wrong book in there. We also use the online textbook called How to Think Like a Computer Scientist. What, uh, are you going to put that link in uh, announcement or something like that? Yep, yep. It's in a syllabus, but I'll also put it out to the side, you know, okay. in uh, one of the modules. That's something I should put in my uh, Google Documents. So what, how to think like a computer scientist is, is it's more like something that you would use in fundamentals of programming. But we do need to learn all this stuff. What is a variable? What is an expression? What is a statement? So it's, it's like we just have two ways of learning these things. We can learn from the textbook, and then we can learn using this. And so I will blip back and forth between them. Not to be confusing, we're going to go primarily based on the textbook. But there are some useful things in here, such as turtle programming, which I do not believe is covered much by the textbook. Just a little bit. Hmm. Wait, are we using MindTap assignments in here? Some, yes. There are programming assignments in MindTap. However, they are annoying enough that I'm not going to overload you with them. Because, And what do I mean by they are annoying? Sometimes you will write one that will give you the correct output and it still won't give you credit for it. And then you complain to me, and I have to go and give you credit for it, and I'd really rather not have to do that too often. So I will be assigning programming problems from them, the ones that I trust to be able to grade correctly, and then others I will, you know, turn into my own programming homework and give you. Meaning you can just type it in code and submit it in? Right, right. All right. As we have to deal with MindTap back in fundamentals, and it's, it's annoying. Yeah, Miss Wilson has to go over them in class. Ugh. Would you recommend bringing a flash drive with your uh, high files on? I would bring a, uh, a flash drive just to. You just like keep your files on them. Yeah, just to keep your files on it. Absolutely, okay. absolutely. And you keep it as your resume too. There it is. Fundamentals of Python, first program. That is the textbook that we actually need. It still uses tap, right? It does, right. So if you've already got C Engage Unlimited, you are, are you are totally good to go. Do you have the force key for it? Yeah, we need it. Are you going to update the page with it? You don't get a course key for it. Instead, I make the section and you join it and you type in your MindTap. Um, when you run MindTap, it wants a course key, but that's if I'm not doing integration with Canvas. Since I'm doing integration with Canvas, I have to create the section, post that link, and instead of it being a course key, you just follow that link and get into it. And so we will work on that on Thursday. <clears throat> just don't really worry about it until then. Yeah, yeah, you don't need the textbook right, right, right away. Okay. 
All right, so that is the textbook we will need. It, it is a good textbook. We've used several different. We were kind of floating from one to the other, you know, in, uh, in order to run this course, and then found this one, and I like it. I like it a lot. So here's my name. I am Professor Jeff Thompson. I don't care if you call me Professor, whatever, right? Mr. Thompson, Professor, hey, Prof. Just don't call me any names. I hurt my feelings. You'll see my contact information right here, and I would consider it a personal favor if you would grab your phone and send me a text right away. And a lot of y'all already have had me in prior classes. Please go ahead and send another text so that I can put you into my contact list for this class. And just put, you know, what class this is and your name, right? There we go. That's your name. No, it's not. But anyways. So that way, I can text you if I know that there's something you need to know. Yo, class is cl uh, closed for today. Yeah, nowadays that's not as important anymore because people sign up for that service that rings their phone, you know, when the campus is closed. But still, or you'll have questions while you're programming. Don't be shy about contacting me when you have questions because you can get a lot of problems solved. You text me, you say, I can't get my program to work. You take a picture of your screen and text it to me, right? And I can look at that, and quite often I'll be able to go, oh, just check line 12. You're missing the blah, blah, blah. And you can get the whole thing up and running in five minutes. Now, sometimes the pro programming problems are more complex than that, and we can't get it done that quickly, but it's still a valuable diagnostic tool. And I stay up really late. So if you're here, you know, if you're at home when it's 1.30, don't worry about waking me up, right? You can go ahead and ask your questions, and if I am asleep, I'll wait until the next morning. But, you know, the students who contact me a lot tend to do better in the courses, right? Because they are getting their questions answered immediately rather than just kind of going, well, I guess I'll wait in class, or I hope he talks about this, or, or whatever. So really, it's a good idea. Add my number to your contacts. Text me. I can text you. We'll get, we'll get further along in the class that way. So the grading scale pretty boring. What do I mean by that? 90s an A, 80s a B, 70s a C, and so on. And people ask me, ooh, is there any way I can get extra credit? Well, if you try really hard on your programs, and, you, and your programs are, you know, if you add something to your program that's, you know, a level or two above what other people did, you know, in what it does, then you may get extra credit for it. Uh, I like to reward people for trying harder on their homework. Um, otherwise, I will mark off an assignment as being extra credit occasionally, right? Meaning that I think it's a good idea for you to do this, but I know that we've dumped a lot of homework on you this week, you know, but, and that way you get some chance to build up some extra credit. So uh, the way the class is broken up is that you get 30% of your credit just for coming in, planting your bottoms on those seats and typing along, right? That's pretty cool, right? As long as you upload something at the end of the day, into one of the drop boxes because we create a daily drop box each day you're good and then homework is another 30 percent and then there's a project for the end of the class which is worth 10 percent so if those things added together is 40 percent and the project is just a, a little bit more sophisticated of a program um, we're not going to have to worry about that now we'll come up upon it the second half of the semester it's where you pretty much have free reign to pick an idea and to write a better program than we've been doing as our homework assignments because our homework assignments are designed to be able to be easily done like within an hour right or something like that a short amount of time and a programming project needs to be something bigger that challenges you and something that you're actually interested in you may not be interested in writing our program that calculates pi right you may be really interested in writing some kind of game or something like that. So that's what the programming project's for. And then the exams are 30 percent, 30 percent of your total. Are the exams killer, crushing, brutal exams? No. Most people pass my exams. Most people do really good on them. Why? They're open book. They're open mind tap. They're open notes. They're open wave your hand and asking professor questions, right? So as long as you come in here with a pretty good idea, of the course material, you're going to rock the exam. Now, if you haven't been coming to class and you haven't been writing your programs, then, then you come in and you take the exam. No, you're not going to do real well at it. But that's just like any other class, right? So don't have test anxiety because you can always ask for help during the exam. If a question is weird, you know, you don't understand it, raise your hand, I'll come look at it. 
I may agree and tell everybody the answer right then and there, right? So don't have test anxiety. So one little caveat here is if you add up these scores, you might figure out that there's maybe a way that you could get a 70% even without turning in any homework. No, you have to write at least half of the assigned programs in order to get a passing grade because it is a programming class. It's not a, it's not a sit through lecture class, right? You actually have to be able to do it. Um, just like if you're, you know, yeah, you can learn a lot about soccer by sitting in the sidelines and watching, but until you actually get out there and try kicking the ball, you're not going to become a soccer player. So I don't want to talk about this too much, but I, it, it always comes up. I won't say always, but it did again last semester. Students are caught plagiarizing or cheating will receive an F for the class, and a record of the incident will be provided to the dean of the School of Business. So what is cheating in a class like that? Well, there's different ways you could cheat. I can't get my program done. I say, yo, can I look at your code? You know, I'm really stuck on it. Oh, can I take a picture of it? Cool, and you go and type it in. Right, that's one way. Or you say, could you mail me your code because I'm really stuck, and then I upload your code as my homework. I forget to take your name off. <laughs> I'm an idiot. No. Um, you know, anyways, you could ask somebody for help like that, and you could be copying their code and uploading it as your own. That's one way. Or you could have two people just sit down and do the homework together and you each upload it. Don't do that. And that's real tempting for people who are roommates, right? You know, you, uh, you live in the same house, you both use the same computer. Don't do it. You have to do your own work. Another kind of more nebulous is Googling up a solution for a program. Now, Google is your friend. Anytime you're stuck, you're probably going to Google before you reach for the textbook to figure out how to do it, right? If I need to know how to draw a square with turtle python, I'll go and I'll find a f some answers for that really, really, really fast, right? Great. Once you find an answer, don't go and copy a whole bunch of code and paste it. Because what they're asking for is probably not going to be what I was asking for. It's just something, right? And that becomes really important during the programming projects. Because if I ask you to write a hangman program, or that's what you choose as your project, there are like 70 million versions of hangman programs that have already been written and posted up because people find it fun to write. And you can go and you could grab one of those and upload it and when you do you're going to get a zero on the project and bad things are going to happen because I'm going to be able to tell it wasn't your code. Or I may ask you to write a program and then you go and you get an answer that's kind of related and you upload it and it's a complete program and it doesn't do hardly anything about what I asked or it doesn't use it in any Google is your friend, copying big chunks of code is not. What you use Google for is for examples of syntax. Right. If I need to know how to use a dictionary in Python, I can go and I can find some examples of that. Of that. Right. I can find lots of examples. That's great. It's a beautiful way of learning. Just don't go and find you know 10, 20, 30 lines. It's like writing a you know an English paper. Is it a good idea to go and copy somebody else's paper and upload it as your own? No. Is it a good idea to go and copy 20 pages you know out of Wikipedia and upload it as your research paper? No. Instead, you read, you understand, you modify, and you make it part of your program if you're going to take anything out. Now, if it winds up that you feel like it's necessary to take 10, 20, 30 lines out of code from offline, give credit to it, right? Just like if you were going to cite a book, you know, in your English paper, give credit for it. Now, it's probably not going to happen, but if for some reason you did, you know, then you'd be kind of proof from the accusations of cheating. You know, you, you gave credit, right? to the, and then I might say, yeah, but I want you to write it your own way or, you know, whatever, we might negotiate something past that point. Absolutely not a problem to go on Google and research stuff. It is a problem to copy, paste, submit, done. Don't do that. So when I give out the programming projects, and I give a list of programming projects that you can do or you can make up one of your own. The Hangman one pretty much has in giant fonts, all caps, do not cheat on this one. Because what happens is, is people think that it sounds easy 
and then they choose that one and then they wait until the, you know two days before the projects are due at the end of the semester and they're stuck and you know so they desperate measures ensue and so yet again last semester had somebody you know do that they went and they copied something and it wouldn't even run in our programming language right it wouldn't run in python 3 because the hangman program had been written for a different older version of python and i was like that's a strong clue that, <laughs> that you probably didn't write it yourself. Anyway, so of course, so I was able to find the exact web page that the program came from, and you know, they got a zero, and, and, and nobody was really happy with the, the results that are graded in the class. So the way the class is normally going to run is we will have, you know, you'll come in, follow along with the tutorials if you want to. So we'll do in-class tutorials. At the end of class, we're just going to upload a document that is either that code or even just a text comment saying I was here. Right. So in Canvas, upload the file you create or a comment saying you were here. Right. Then you get credit. You get credit for that. That's like 30% of your grade just doing that. Yes, sir. Do we upload it as a PI file? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Just making sure. Mm -hmm. Although I suppose you could copy and paste from Python into a comment. That'd be interesting. Anyways, yeah, yeah. Ju okay, just you're just going to upload the file that you created or a comment. Okay. And we'll, we and we'll do that in a minute. And then for homework, you know, you'll write the Python program. Usually it's going to be a Python program. I don't give you, like, essays, right? And then you're going to upload the source for that and a screenshot. So we'll have to learn how to take screenshots. And 99% of y'all already know how to take screenshots. And there's like 20 different ways on these computers. Each, you know, each operating system introduced a new way of doing it. But I will walk you through one way that I know works on every Windows machine. And then you can just replace my one dumb way with your better way. It's totally fine. OK, and then there are also mind tap exercises, mind tap quizzes, and stuff like that. And so those are worth a little bit of a grade. But we'll be doing this at the each class. You're going to be getting, you know, an extra couple of points for being here. What happens if you miss the class? Yep. Watch the video. And then fill out a video review form. Video review form is just something that says, yes, I watched the video. And then list a couple things that you learned from it, right? If you also feel, feel like typing along and uploading that file, that's cool. Yeah, but you don't have to. Some people find it useful to type along with the videos. Some people just want to watch it, right? Either way is fine. Same is true in class. If you don't want to type along, you don't have to. That's why you know you can just fill in a comment saying you're here when we do the in-class tutorial. So let's do that. I'm going to make the Dropbox so that we can upload what we've done today. All right, so right now our home page is set to the syllabus page, but we'll change that so that the home page like goes to the modules or the assignments. And it's not like that right now. So go ahead and click on assignments. And you'll see that roll call attendance, like I said, you can just ignore that. It'll show you your current roll call, but it doesn't actually plug into a grade. Something called Lecture A First Program. And I, I bet everybody knows how to do this, but we're gonna work on it together anyways. So I'm gonna open that. And where it says submit assignment, I'm going to click that. And then there's a couple options you can do here. There's text entry. Say you didn't write the program. You didn't feel like it. That's not your best learning style. You just put a comment. Here, right? Doesn't have to be a cool comment. Don't call me any names in it or whatever. But, you know, you can put whatever you wanted to in the text entry. But you did type along with the program. I saw most of y'all doing it. So instead, you'd want to use file upload. Choose file, and you'd have to go and find where you saved your file and upload it that way. You don't have to get fancy and zip it. You can if you want, doesn't matter, but since most of our programs in the early days and at least through most of, almost all of our programs are just going to be one file. There may be times when there's one, um, more than one file to upload, but usually it's just one file, so zipping is, it over, is overkill. Now, notice I called it Lecture A, but I think in my notes I said, where'd it go? 
I, I said first program. I number the days of lecture by their letters, A, B, C, D, E, F, and G, while I number homework by numbers, one, two, three. That way it's easy to say, okay, in program C, we did blah, 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 and you know program C is a lecture. And in homework four, we did this. And so it's an easy way to distinguish them. So that's why it says lecture A. So anyways, I'm gonna go and I'm gonna choose my, choose file, lecture A, looks like I've already done so. I could add more files if I wanted to and I could click Submit Assignment. And by the way, since in this class is not going to come up too often, there's not multiple files to upload, but if there were, it's easier on the teacher if you submit them all at the same time, right? If I had three different program files, it's much better to go and choose each file. It says no file chosen. I thought I really, really thought I did that. All right, there we go. It's just easier on them. Now, if you redo the homework programming assignment, then yeah, you're obviously not going to do it at that time. Okay, and then I click, I could add a comment. I could say, the program doesn't calculate, the, you don't have to type this, the correct value, but most of it works. <laughs> Whatever. What am I doing there? If your program doesn't work, give me a clue. Don't let me be surprised by it when I open up your program and run it. Um, you'll get a better grade if you tell me up front what's wrong with your program than if you just upload it and, you know, it's a surprise package for me, right? I don't know whether it's going to work or not. Yeah, so if your program isn't working correctly, and I don't mean for the daily assignments. For the daily assignments, there's no guarantee that you're actually going to be able to, you know, to get it all working and maybe it's at the end of the class period and there's a syntax error and it doesn't run, who cares, right? Just upload it. The, uh, the daily type alongs are just for you to learn. I don't count off if they don't run, which is why you have the option of just coming over here to text entry and saying I was here, right? But your homework had better run, right? If it crashes, then you're not gonna get much credit for it. If it doesn't crash, but it doesn't do what it's supposed to do, you'll get more credit than if it crashed, but still not much credit. Okay, so anyways, I'm going to submit that. But I don't think you can get a program to crash in Python. Oh, sure. You sure you can. What's the classic error? Divide by zero. What if we did this? I'm going to try that. You know, y is equal to zero divided by one. I'm going to run it. Oh, neat, it didn't crash. You're right, you can't crash pipe. No, I'm totally kidding. You absolutely can. I just did not manage to do that. Apparently, Python does not care about divide by zero the way some. Yeah, there's plenty of ways. There's plenty of ways to crash Python. I wonder what divide by zero is actually producing. <laughs> ah, what do you know? Something divided, zero divided by. S oh, wait, that's because I did not divide by zero. I divided zero by something. There we go. Okay, so, boom, I got a big old splash full of red text. Yeah, yeah. You'll see this a lot. <laughs> when you're running your programs, you'll, it'll run a certain way, and then it may generate an error. This is what's known as a runtime error. Runtime error is when the program will run, but then it reaches a state from which it cannot recover. Like it tries to open a file, but that drive is right protected or it has a bad file name or something like that. It can't do that, so it gives up. In programming, you can't divide by zero, so it gives up, right? There's all sorts of problems that can generate, you know, a runtime. Just error. like in mathematics. Yeah, yeah, people will say, yeah, but dividing by zero is infinity. Well, a computer doesn't know what infinity is, and so that's why it's got to, that's why it's got to generate the error. So, that is one category of error, is a runtime error. But another one, one is syntax errors. You can get syntax errors and you can get runtime errors. And then you can get logic errors. So what's a syntax error? Syntax error is when I just type in something wrong. I indented something wrong, or like this is a real easy one to do. People will mix up uppercase and lowercase, and it's sometimes hard to spot, right? If you walked in, you saw this code, you might not type it in wrong. It looks like good code. 
or if I've got it correct, you may accidentally hit the shift key on one of these because we're real used to you know, shifting the first letter of every sentence we write. Well, it's not going to work. It's going to give me an error, right? Or what if I misspelled one of these function names, right? Print, right? That's not going to work. These are syntax errors. Now, if Python being a kind of a funny beast, the syntax errors and the runtime errors kind of look the same, right? Because some programming languages like C++ and Java go through a step called compilation, and it's not until compilation is done that uh, it even tries executing the code. Um, Python is sort of like that, but not really. It is an interpreted language, and so it does a light compilation first just to kind of do a syntax check on everything. But then, then in the, only then will it go ahead and run. But things like missing variable names, sometimes the code will, will run halfway through before it notices the error. But anyways, that's a syntax error because I, the word print is not found. What if this was not an invalid statement? Right. That did not crash, but we still got, oh. See, it's hitting this error before it ever gets to this wrong statement because things work in order. Let me fix that one. And there, name Y is not defined. And that's the kind of thing that can drive you crazy because you don't notice that it's capitalized in one line and not the other. But what that's saying is that, and it does tell you the line number, and it would be really nice if, like in some programming languages, there were line numbers down the side of the page. Like yeah, yeah, like Visual Studio. Like, uh, uh, just about every programming editor has an option to turn on line numbers. <clears throat> this one doesn't. Sad face. But at least you can tell your line number down here, right? So what line number did that say? It said line 13. I can put my cursor in here, and I can scroll up and down, watching my line numbers until I get to 13. And then you're looking at that, and no, there's nothing wrong with that. I swear that syntax is good. If you look at a line, and you swear that that line is good, look to the line above it to see if the problem is there. And in this case, it is. Or below it. Can you get Python themes that have line counting? You can get different editors. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> we really should play with using uh, PyCharm, because I believe it's got one. Yeah. While wow, that's loading in the background, let's uh, go back to. Just imagine we have to show up three times a week. It'll be only 50 minutes. Yeah, this campus used to offer some classes that met Monday, Wednesday, Friday. But it was kind of confusing because you would only meet every other Friday. And those, those Monday, Wednesday classes were shorter than the Tuesday, Thursday classes, and it was kind of enough to make your brain melt, so they stopped doing that. <laughs> Universities still do that. Yeah. Which me, I'll be like. So, in order to do your homework, you're definitely going to need Python 3. And like you've seen, you could do it from class. I mean, uh, uh, you could do it online with those online text editors, but you're going to be happier if you install it. And so we'll put a link on here so that you can install it. You don't have to do that today, right? But, <clears throat> you know, before the week is done, we're going to have posted the link to go and install Python. You don't really even have to wait for me to post that link, though, because you can just go to python.org, and then boom, you're at the site where you're going to want to install it from. Download for Windows. Well, if you're not on Windows, you're a Mac user, okay, well, download for Mac, whatever. And so you can't use it for 3.55 or above Windows XP. Yeah. That sucks. <clears throat> so what you're going to want to do is after you've done one of your homework assignments, I need to fix all the syntax errors in this one because I'm not going to get full credit if there are syntax errors in it. So I'm going to run it. Ooh, okay, that's looking good. Once you get it kind of working, move your page around like this so that you see your source code and you see some of the output and you're going to take a picture. 
and don't whip out your phone, just hit the print screen button. <clears throat> it's next to the F12 key or whatever. Hit the print screen button, and this is one way of taking screenshots, and like I said, there's 30 million different ways, and you know a better way. But if you don't, press the print screen button, nothing happens. Well, something did happen. It copied the screen into the computer so that you can go into Paint or Word or something like that and paste it. Do you like Word? Launch Word. Do you like Paint? Launch Paint. It doesn't matter what program you launch. You just launch it and paste it. Right? Where's the paste? option on these things. I mean, I know how to do it with com <clears throat> with keyboard commands. Control V is paste, but I was hoping to see like a paste link right up there and I don't. Anyways, <clears throat> so now I've got it. And then I would save it. Or Word. Word's kind of cool because you could easily paste a whole bunch of screenshots on there if you wanted to. But anyways, and then just save your document and upload that and the screenshot. Don't bother with screenshots during in class, right? You got to go to the next class, right? You got to get out of here and do something else. You're not going to waste your time doing screenshots. But if doing the screenshots shows that the code worked at home. So you're going to definitely want to do that. And if I don't specify it in the homework assignment, I want you to do it anyways. Right, right. So there I pasted a screenshot. Now what we could have done, and I've never done this, and I'm not gonna start doing it now, is ask people to put the source code in with the screenshot in a Word file. You know, that, that's getting too picky. But you could do that if you wanted to, woohoo. You know, I've, I've put my source code in there as well now. Well, I thought I did, but I don't see it. Anyways, so I'm gonna save my screenshot. I'm gonna put it in the same directory just because that kind of makes sense to me. The computers in this class don't let us customize the uh, no, the uh, shortcuts up here, because I would really like to be able to. I need to ask about this again. You know, on your home machine, you can drag a folder over into your Quick Access. Oh, it did work. It wasn't working last semester. Yay! They they uh they listened. People care. All right. So, anyways. No, I'm not, I'm not going to save it as Jeff Thompson. I'm going to save it as Lecture A. Right. Me? No, I'm not going to save it as my name. Because that is, well, stupid. So if you use Windows Explorer to go to your directory, and you don't see file extensions, you're going to want to change it so that you can. Does so everybody see file extensions when you're on, on these, uh, these campus computers, mm -hmm. or do you have to disable, uh, enable it? On your home computer, it may not be there. It may just say Lecture A and then Lecture A, and you don't, won't know which one is which unless you go and look under the type. If that is the case, then what you're going to want to do is change the options to display file extensions or to not hide file extensions, which is the default. So if you install you know, Windows 10 or you bring your laptop home, by default it's going to be hiding these extensions. What you do is you choose View, Options, Change Folder and Search Options. I wish it wasn't five steps, but you click View and then notice Hide Extensions. That's always checked on your default installations of Windows 10 or Windows 7 or you know whatever don't want to hide your extensions. It makes it much easier to work with your operating system if you can see the, the three or the four letter extension right. That way you don't accidentally upload the wrong file. And that happens more often than not. Not in this class, but in some other classes like uh, C++ programming, it, it'll create a whole bunch of different programs. When you create your programming project, right, you know, it, it creates like 17 different programs and, and, and files that are associated with it, and only one of them is the one that we want, and it's way too easy to pick the wrong one. Okay, so I saved it as a screenshot. Such as .cpp, that's one of what we want, then we get the... Well, we want the PY file, and for your homework, you want the screenshot as well. So I would go back to assignments, 
and hopefully I would have done this. Actually, you know, get your screenshot before you've uploaded anything to it because just like I said, it's easier on the instructor if you upload everything at the same time, but I didn't. So I'm going to go in and upload my screenshot now. And you certainly don't have to. Like I said, it's not necessary for the lectures to do the screenshots, but I feel like it. So, and so I can do resubmit assignment. And then I might choose both files, right? I can use shift click to select several different files. No, it's not letting you. You have to do one at a time. All right, well, I can do that. Oh, it looks like we're submitting the same one twice. That's not necessary. All right, so please do give me screenshots, and I'll try to add comments to the homework assignments saying, you know, screenshot, but even if I don't, I want you to do it. Consider it mandatory. So speaking of which, why don't we make that our first programming assignment? Our first homework, that is. Since this is so introductory, we're going to call it homework zero. Zero? Why'd you start programming at zero? Well, you will find as you do your career in programming that computers tend to start counting at zero rather than one. If you have a list of items, the first one's actually item zero. Seems silly, but it's true. So just to kind of reinforce that fact, I, I name the first homework assignment zero. Okay, so what is homework zero going to be? Install Python. Now, if you took fundamentals, you probably already have Python installed on your computer. So, are you going to have to reinstall it? Nah, don't bother. So, but, what does that work? Install Python on your home computer. Pretend I can type. Then launch idle and take a screenshot upload that screenshot. I'm going to show you a quirk. I don't know if y'all ever see this quirk, but it was in a state where you could not use the space bar. I was typing along and trying to hit the space bar and it wasn't doing it. So it fixed itself by backing it up and going back to it. Upload that screenshot. That's the homework assignment. That's what gets you 100% credit is to install Python. And if you've already installed it, great. Just take, just launch idle and take the screenshot. Okay. So homework is generally due a week after it is assigned. I try to put due dates on everything because if there's no due date on it, then when you're looking at the Canvas page, it may not be up at the top of the list, which is a real drag. If you notice something that doesn't have a due date, Please text me and comment on it so I can fix that. But I'll never surprise you by saying, okay, we're here Tuesday and there's something due Thursday. And if I forget to put a due date, then I'll usually put the due date as being a week from the point where I noticed that there wasn't a due date on it. But like I said, usually you have a week. So since today is the 21st, I want you to get it done, you know, by midnight of the 27th. So syllabus addendum, all classes are supposed to now link to this common addendum. So the more classes you have, the more often you will see this. But there's some useful information in here. Again, there's a big write-up on ad academic integrity, meaning don't turn in somebody else's homework. I've had people take in work that they copied from somebody else's machine and by rights, we're supposed to fail both person people to put because you know I don't know whether you shared your code with somebody else and that's really drag just don't 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 do it don't take somebody else's work and submit it as your own so the ADA accommodation if you have any needs that are you know 
particular to you, you need to sit in the first two rows or you need extra time on exams or stuff like that, you're going to want to go and talk to the Student Access Services in the Learning Resource Center. They'll help you fill out a form that you bring to me, you know, and I'll bend over backwards to, uh, you know, make it, make things easy for you to learn. So this is actually pretty cool here. There is free counseling here. And what's awesome about it is that it's free. What's more awesome is that they're good at it. So if there are things going on in your personal life that are making it hard for you to get your schoolwork done, go talk to them. If there are things going on in your personal life and it's not even affecting your schoolwork, but it's still hard to deal with, go and talk to them. Since y'all are here, this doesn't matter, but please be aware that if you don't participate in the first week of class, for any class, 16-week classes, you can actually get two weeks, but uh, then you will be dropped from the course and an AW put on your transcript, and you can't get refunds, and there's really no way you can get rid of it. So always show up for the first week of class. It used to be that people would run a scam where they would enroll in a course and they'd get a lot of money from you know some sponsor in order to go to uh, school, and then they wouldn't go to school, and they wouldn't pay that bill, and they'd use that money, and then they'd go to a different state, and they'd do it again, and nowadays that doesn't really work anymore. Hopefully everybody knows that you have a uh, email address, school email address, and how to check your mail. The Learning Resource Center, got lots of stuff in it, it's cool. If you were here before and then after they built the new one, then you know that the new one is really pretty awesome. This is the Career Center, assist students with career exploration, career planning, job search. The student handbook, this is a lengthy thing, it's well worth reading or at least kind of ogling and going, yeah, I know where I could go in order to get the stuff that I need to know. All right, so you will need to get the, uh, the textbook soon. I need to create the MindTap section for our class and I will post that. So to reiterate, you don't email me asking for a key like you do in some courses. Instead, I will post a link and you will access that link after having logged on to, you know, MindTap or C-Engage. And if you haven't bought C-Engage or MindTap at that point, then you can just whip out your credit card and buy it right then and there. If you run into problems trying to use MindTap or C-Engage, a couple of things you got to do. One is you're probably using ad blockers. Everybody uses ad blockers. You're going to want to whitelist our site and MindTap site. Well, how do you whitelist? Well, this, you, you just disable your ad blocker for that particular page. And you may be paranoid and have 20 or 30 different ad blockers going on. I've got two going on right now. Also, um, if you're trying to access it like from your iPad or something like that, pop-ups may be disabled. It won't be able to create a new window. And so, you just got to keep disabling all these funky, funky features until you actually are able to get it to work. Last but not least, if you cannot get into MindTap to register or something like that the first time, launch some browser that you never use, like Edge or whatever, and go and register with it from there. Make sure it works that way, and then you can go back to your favorite browser and figure out, you know, what was wrong. But the ad blockers and the cookie blockers are usually at fault when people cannot get MindTap to work on their machine. I think we've talked about enough for today. So when we come in on Thursday, the MindTap link will be done. Don't worry if you don't have your book by then, but you're going to want to get it really soon because we will have our first, you know, reading assignments posted on it as of Thursday. And then we will do some real programming, real lecturing, and it's going to be more fun than it was today. So any questions? Any questions? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, if you want to use another editor, I have people use Visual Studio, I've had people use PyCharm. Keep using the one that you're good at, or you can switch between them. Just because I use Idle in here, the only reason I use Idle in here is because I know that it's installed as soon as everybody installs Python. Excellent question. Who'd you have it with? Uh, Ms. Wilson. Oh, okay, cool.
Is the screenshot taking the picture? Yep, yep. But not taking a picture with your camera. Instead, it's hitting the print screen button on right. your keyboard Check. and pasting it. Got it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. All righty. So I'll see y'all Thursday. And here's my comment.